In today's notes, we're going to take a look at angled pair relationships and their proof. So at the top, it says that when you interpret a diagram, you can assume information about size, direction, or measure only if it's marked. So given to the picture to the right, for each bullet point, we're going to either circle the word can or cannot um, assume that statement to be true based on the picture. So the first one says, all points are coplanar. So I'm looking at the plane, all points are within. We can assume that. G, F, and E are collinear. So these points. We cannot assume that to be true as we don't see a line that's going through each of those three points. The next one, line B, F. So if I highlight line B, F and CE intersect. We cannot assume that to be true as we cannot see it. Angle BHA and angle CJA are congruent. So BHA is this, is this angle here and CJA is this angle here. It's because nothing is marked, okay, if they're congruent, they would be the same size, but once again, we cannot assume anything about size, direction, or measure um, unless it's marked. And since nothing is marked, we cannot assume that to be true. The next one, angle AHB, this angle right here, and angle BHD, this angle right here, form a linear pair. And we can assume that because there are two angles along a straight line. And then last, AHF. Let me grab a different color. AHF, this angle here. And angle BHD, this angle here, um, are vertical angles, and that's true. So anytime two lines intersect, vertical angles um, are formed. So can. So below in this table, we have our properties. And the first four properties are properties from Algebra 1. You use these properties to justify your statements when solving an equation. The two new properties, which I'll show you some examples in terms of geometry after we go through them, um, are reflexive property and substitution property. For the reflexive property, that property states that a quantity is equal to itself, okay? Using the same terminologies or terminology as the other properties, referring to quantities and um, equivalents. The substitution property says a quantity may be substituted let me spell that right substituted for its equal and substituted or replaced. Now in terms of proof, okay, we don't talk about quantities such as angles or segments being equal to itself, but we do proofs in terms of congruency. And that's the same with the substitution property. So let's skip to those two new properties before we review or see how we can relate the other properties to geometry. So the reflexive property, here's angle B, and it just is stating that angle B is congruent to angle B. That's the reflexive property. Substitution. Um, substitution looks like uh, if given that angle A is congruent to angle B, and also angle A is congruent to angle C, what can you conclude? 
So I'm going to use this symbol here, the three dots, which means therefore. So given that, I can therefore conclude that B and C would have to be congruent. What you can do, since A is congruent to B, where the A is here, you can replace that angle with its congruent angle. Okay, so that replacing property is the substitution. So if A is congruent to B and A is congruent to C, then B and C are congruent. Let's go back to the beginning, or that first property, which is addition. So when you add a quantity to another quantity, that sum is larger. Okay, so with the addition property, say I number this 1, 2, and 3. So I start with uh, two small angles, um, and rather than calling that angle PX cubed, it's just shorter to call an angle 1. So angle 1, so I'm going to give you that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. That's given. And I want to show that angle PXR, okay, since it's the whole angle, which is the sum of the two or includes those two parts, if I want to conclude that angle PXR is congruent to SXQ, We went from a small to large we, must, large, we must have added something. Now to start, it was just these two congruent angles. And then you see this angle where they overlap. That angle was added to angles one and three to get the whole. So up top for the ref, um, addition property, it says that e equal quantities are added to equal quantities. Well, instead of using equal, we have angle 1 congruent to angle 3, so there's a congruent quantity. And we also need another, so that's where the reflexive property comes in. Angle 2 is obviously congruent to itself. So we needed those quantities in order to add. 1 plus 2 gives us PXR, and 3 plus 2 gives us SXQ. Okay, so we need that reflexive property. Oops. Subtraction. Well, subtraction, you start with something, you take it away, you end up with a smaller um, number. So if this is an angle, I'm going to start with this large angle. So I'm going to give you that angle ABD is congruent to angle EBC. Okay, I'm going to number these again. One, two, and three. I want to end up with the smaller angle one congruent to the smaller angle three. Well, if you look at the part that's overlapping again, this angle, if I were to take that orange angle away from the red, I'd be left with just this. Same with that blue angle. If I took that away from the blue angle, I'd be left with just that. So I need another quantity congruent to itself, angle 2, congruent to angle 2, in order to subtract. Now with multiplication, okay, it means I need to double. And if given in the picture this angle is congruent to that angle, it must mean that AB was a bisector. So let's call this angle 1, angle 2. So I can say that if I multiply the measure of angle 1 by 2, we get the measure of angle CAD. And you can also do that with angle 2. So there's multiplication and last division. So let's say to start that angle G is congruent to angle S. So they're the same measure. And now I'm going to bisect each. So let's call this P and I'll call it angle 1 and angle 2. Sketch a bisector here. I'll call it T 
angle 3, angle 4. So given that G is congruent to S and that GP bisects angle G and ST bisects angle S, what can we conclude? Well, we can conclude, because it's an angle bisector, that 1 is congruent to 2, and that angle 3 is congruent to angle 4. And since, to start, the angles were congruent, and then you just cut them in half, that all the halves are equal. So we can also say that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2, which is congruent to angle 3, which is congruent to angle 4. Okay, and that's because halves of congruent angles are congruent. So that's how we apply the properties uh, from Algebra 1 to geometry. New okay, statements and reasons for our proofs are in this table below. Okay, So we're going to look at three statements and reasons today. So given this picture with a straight line and that A and B, the two angles, share that ray, we know that they form a linear pair. So again, we're avoiding in proofs plus symbols, the addition symbol, minus symbols. So rather than say that A plus B equals 180, we say that A and B are supplementary. And that's because linear pairs are supplementary. In the next picture, it says 1 and 2 are supplementary, and 3 and 2 are supplementary. So because they're supplements to this same angle, we can say that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. The same would be down below for complements. If 4 and 5 add up to 90, and 6 and 5 add up to 90, because they share that same number, Right, so if this angle was 30, and 3 and 6, or 5 and 6 add up to 90, then 6 must be 60. And if 4 and 5 add up to 90, and that's 30, this must be 60. So we can also say that angle 4 is congruent to angle 6. And that's because, um, in the first one, supplements... of the same angle or congruent angles, we'll throw that in there, are congruent. And this is the same for the next one, we're just going to say complements of the same angle or congruent angles are congruent. So our first proof. As we mentioned, the reading proofs are like a puzzle. So here are our puzzle pieces. All of these statements and reasons. So we need to put those together in order to prove that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3, which is the vertical angle proof. So we're going to prove that all vertical angles are congruent. The first step, as the reading highlighted, is uh, we make a two-column uh, chart or whatever. It's already done for you. You do your T-chart, put the label, statements, and reasons. That's there. And then we number. The first line is always the given, and we don't just draw a line. Okay, If it's your homework and your notes, that's okay. But for the state test and for any assessment for me, the first step is always to write your givens. So A, B, and C, D intersect at E. OK, 
okay? Number two, to do the vertical angle proof, we use linear pairs. So since one and two are supplementary, and three and two are supplementary, they're supplements to the same angle, they are congruent. So always have that plan in mind, okay? So step number two would be to say that angle one and angle two are supplementary. And then angle two and angle three are supplementary. It's the same reason. So you need to memorize the statements and reasons uh, for the proofs. And that because linear pairs are supplementary. And then number three, we're done. Angle one is congruent to angle three because supplements of the same angle, they're both supplement to angle two, are congruent. Okay, last two pages. So from seventh grade, you went over all of your angle pairs formed by two parallel lines cut by a transversal. So just to review the vocab, a transversal, so in this case T, if you look at the diagram to the right, is a line that intersects two or more coplanar uh, co lines at different points. Parall or parallel lines are lines that lie in the same plane and never intersect. So if we had to sketch line three parallel to L2, here would be an example of line three. To note parallel lines, make one or two arrows. So given down below that M and N are parallel, and there are some letters there that mark each of the angles cut by the transversal, we're going to note which angle pairs they are and what the relationship they share is. So if we locate W and P, that's the first one. Look at their location. And then look at the location of Y and R. So the other two pairs that go along with the given pairs would be X and Q and Z and S. Those angles are called corresponding angles. Corresponding, and they are congruent. So in middle school, you didn't have to memorize the names, but because you're referring them in a proof, you do have to have the names memorized. Now I want you to locate Y and Q, and then the other pair that goes along with that would be Z and P. They are alternate interior angles, and they are congruent. Locate X and R. <coughs> Excuse me. And the angle that goes with X and R, the other pair would be W and S. Those angles are alternate exterior. And they are also congruent. Y and P goes along with Z and Q. They are on the same side of the transversal and inside or in between the parallel lines. So these are same side interior angles. And they are not congruent, but supplementary. So if you read the stars, as recall from the reading, postulates are used to prove theorems. The corresponding angles postulate is used to prove the alternate interior angles theorem. The alternate exterior angles theorem and the same side interior angles theorem. So this postulate is used to prove all the three theorems within the table. But if you notice, they all start with if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. So that's how you need to start your 
reasons in a proof that involves two parallel lines cut by a transversal. So we're going to use this postulate to prove the theorem below. So if we look at what we're trying to prove, we're trying to prove angle 1 congruent to angle 2. This is the alternate interior angles proof because those are alternate interior angles. So I'm going to write down the givens. So line AB is parallel to line CD. And to prove this theorem, we have to use the corresponding angles postulate. So I'm going to put uh, angle 3, or number 3 right there, to refer to that angle. And I know that 2 is congruent to 3 because they are corresponding angles. So angle 2 is congruent to angle 3. And I have to start by saying, if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then corresponding angles are congruent. Now, adding the three there gave me this pair of vertical angles. We know those are congruent. So angle one is congruent to angle three because all vertical angles are congruent. Now, if they're both congruent to angle three, they are congruent to each other by the substitution property. And we're done. So angle one is congruent to angle two by the substitution property. And then to finish, we're going to look at applying the algebra, okay, which is um, what you mostly did in seventh grade. So in number three, find the measure of angle TUP, and TUP is right here. Okay, we know that this angle is congruent to that angle because they are vertical angles, so I need to know X so I can plug it in there. Well, based on the angles that are given, this angle here, that angle there, and these are the parallel lines cut by the transversal. These are the same side interior angles. And they are supplementary. So 6x plus 2x is 8x, and then 65 minus 13 is 52. So they equal 180. Subtract 52. We get 128 divided by 8, x is 16. So I need to plug it in here as this angle is congruent to that angle. So 2 times 16 is 32, and 32 minus 13 is 19. So the measure of angle TUP is 19 degrees. Number 4, find the measure of WX. Z. So let's trace that. It's this angle here. And that angle is congruent to this angle because they're alternate interior angles. So their measures are equal. So 5y equals 2y plus 78. Subtract the 2y from 5y, we get 3y. Divide by 3 and y is 26. So then 5 times 26 equals 130. So the measure of angle WXZ is 130 degrees. And last, find the value of A that guarantees that line R is parallel to line S. So we have two transversals. And the only angle we're given along that transversal is the angle whose measure is 5a minus 1. And then along this transversal, we're given those two angles. 
these two angles are corresponding. So I don't need that. And corresponding angles are congruent. So we can set their measure or measures equal. So I'm going to add the 8 over, we get 22. Subtract 3a from 4a, and we get 1a. And we are done with day one notes.